investigations continue into the U.S. airstrike in Afghanistan. Initiative to empower 10,000 startups in Africa is launched by the Tony Elumelu Foundation. And the latest design trends during Colombia's first ever fashion week. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. First to West Africa. At least 17 people were killed in three blasts in the northeastern Nigerian city of Damaturu on Wednesday by unidentified suicide bombers. Wednesday's coordinated attacks, the worst to hit the capital of Yobi State since July, were carried out shortly after 6 a.m. near a mosque and shops in the suburbs. The state emergency management agency in Yobi said the three suicide bombers were teenage bombers boys. And now for the latest on the attacks, uh, Jonathan Gopemp of Channels, Channels TV joins us live via phone from Damaturu. Uh, Jonathan, welcome to Africa 54. Thank you so much. Yes, now can you explain or at least describe to us what exactly happened today? Well, uh, as early as 5.30 a.m. local time, uh, some suicide bombers evade uh, Damatru, the Yobe state capital. And um, it was too early anyway for the suicide bombers to have a crowd in a gathering that they could uh, hit more than they did. Uh, when they came, what happened precisely was they were able to gather some local uh, um, pastoralists who were residing outskirt of town. They gathered them in the name of, uh, they will uh, conduct a preaching. So when the villagers gathered around, uh, two of the suicide bombers, one was holding a gun, were told by local uh, security, while the other was in, he was just on his own without anything. But uh, later on, the one holding gun left them while the, the other one detonated a hidden explosive devices around his, himself, so he was able to de uh, detonate the explosive, killing 13 people uh, de uh, at, 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 at that uh, pastoralist now, village. Now, Jonathan, so, Jonathan, we're here. Of course, there were other places where attacks occurred. Uh, have you been able to confirm that the attackers were indeed teenage boys? Yes, uh, we were, uh, you know, immediately after the first attack, uh, the, we were told that uh, the suicide bombers moved into the town where they attacked uh, Buhari Housing Estate, located north of Damatru. And uh, the, there are some, uh, one of the uh, victim killed is a 19-year undergraduate student who we were told by the the, the, the father of the deceased, that uh, the boy attempted to, 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 to hold the person with a gun unknowingly to him. The man with the gun was also uh, having some explosive devices, and the explosive devices went off killing two of them there and then. Uh, one other one, which we were told, that, was, that is the third one, uh, I, he is also a teenager, we were told, went to a shop in the name he wanted to buy some um, some uh, uh, medicine drugs so to say so in the process he detonated explosive devices killing about six people there and then two well jonathan thank you very much for uh filling us in uh jonathan Garpip is a reporter with channels tv of nigeria now, as investigations continue into the U.S. airstrike that hit a doctors without borders hospital in the Afghan city of Kunduz, the top U.S. general in Afghanistan says the United States would never deliberately target a medical facility. General John Campbell also told the Senate committee Tuesday he thinks the current plan to reduce U.S. forces in Afghanistan should be revised. VOA Pentagon correspondent Kalabab has more. The deadly airstrike in the Afghan city of Kunduz mistakenly hit the Doctors Without Borders Hospital. That's what the top U.S. general in Afghanistan told a Senate committee Tuesday. The decision to provide aerial fires was a U.S. decision made within the U.S. chain of command. A hospital was mistakenly struck. 
we would never intentionally target a protected medical facility. The strike was in response to an Afghan request for U.S. air support after Afghan security forces came under heavy Taliban fire. The security forces continue to battle pockets of Taliban fighters within the city. To prevent incidents like this deadly strike, General Campbell has directed forces he commands to conduct in-depth training to review operational authorities and rules of engagement. The task will be easier with Afghanistan's current leadership, according to some analysts. The United States knows that there's not going to be a huge protest and, um, and all types of angry statements coming from Kabul. And I think that that lower temperature will allow the U.S. and Afghanistan to work a bit more closely, cooperate a bit more closely to ensure this type of thing doesn't happen again. The Taliban's surprise, though brief takeover of Kunduz has forced Afghanistan back into the spotlight. After repeated by objections by by many U.S. lawmakers, President Obama has agreed hey, to way, reassess the drawdown timetable, which currently would remove all but a few U.S. soldiers by the end of 2016. I do believe that we have to provide our senior leadership options uh, different than the current plan that we're going with. Absolutely. Afghanistan has called for U.S. troops to extend their stay. General Campbell warns the current drawdown would diminish U.S. counterterrorism capabilities and training operations. But now for the latest developments, Carla Babb uh, joins us live via Skype from the Pentagon. Carla, the MSF uh, does not seem to be very keen on a U.S. investigation. Can you tell us more about their proposition? No, uh, Doctors Without Borders were very vocal today. They want to have what they call an international humanitarian fact-finding commission. This is something that is within the Geneva Conventions. It was actually invented in the 1970s, but it's never been activated before. And so they are, they are calling for this to be activated for the first time to have an independent investigation. What are officials saying? Will they cooperate if this is uh, implemented indeed? Well, General Campbell has stressed that he would cooperate. The United States and NATO would cooperate with an independent investigation. Uh, but in the meantime, there are already three investigations underway. Let's not forget that the Afghan government is conducting an investigation, NATO is conducting an investigation, and the United States. But uh, it's clear here, I mean, there's an acknowledgement that a mistake was made. I mean, the issue is whether, uh, as MSF uh, claims, this was a deliberate targeting of this hospital. Do you get the sense that that is what MSF is insisting on? Well, MSF, the important thing for Doctors Without Borders is that some accountability has to be made because people, doctors in this organization are putting their lives on the line and they feel that this has to be taken care of without a pass, without a blank check, as one of their spokespeople said today, because they said if no one is held accountable, who is going to protect these doctors in these areas doing this valuable work? And the United States and the Pentagon says that this is very valuable work. So they want to make sure that their humanitarian efforts are controlled and taken care of so situations like this will not happen again. As for the Pentagon, they are calling it a tragic mistake. I was talking to Captain Jeff Davis, who is a spokesperson here, and that is exactly how he characterized it today. He says that this is something that they they deeply regret and that they are going to get to the bottom of it to find out what went wrong and make sure that something like this does not happen again. So, in the meantime, it looks like it will uh, call for a kind of uh, adjustment in the way information is uh, uh, kind of uh, transferred between uh, the command and those who are executing the orders. Yes, General Campbell has said that everyone under his command is going to be conducting training immediately to go through the rules of engagement, uh, and they are trying to get the results to these investigations as soon as possible. The NATO investigation, we're supposed to be seeing results from that in the next few days. The United States investigation, that's what we call in Pentagon speak a 15-6. That's much more detailed, and that will take a little bit more time. And uh, the other side of this is that actually the U.S. is not opposed to this uh, Doctors Without Borders uh, proposal for an independent investigation, right? Well, the United States hasn't said anything either way. The United States is, is very proud of its investigations. Uh, the Pentagon was saying today that their investigations are, are conducted accurately, that they're not trying to hide anything. They're trying to be completely transparent. Uh, but 
I, people in the halls here, they do understand how Doctors Without Borders feels because if the Afghan government or the United States government or NATO was at fault, it's, it's kind of a conflict of interest for them to be conducting the investigation in the eyes of Doctors Without Borders. So there's, there's not any calls that an independent investigation absolutely should not happen. It's not like that. It's, it's we, we are going to cooperate either way, but we trust our investigations. Carla, thank you very much for your reporting. Thank you. Uh, Carla Bob, VOA Pentagon correspondent reporting live uh, via Skype from uh, the Pentagon. Now, South Sudan President Salva Kiir recently ordered the number of regional states be nearly tripled to 28 from the existing 10 states. The United States, Britain and Norway say that move is a source of serious concern and have called on Mr. Kiir to hold off until the transitional government of national unity is formed and a national transitional dialogue can take place. Well, now, Kier's presidential order has already been denounced by the opposition, who say the move violates a peace agreement to end nearly two years of fighting that stipulates opposition leader Rek Machar must be consulted on major government issues. Mashar's supporters also worry the division of states will weaken their position within the government if the two sides start working with one another, as opposition governors would get fewer key posts. Uh, but speaking to VOA, South Sudan Vice President James Wani Eager said it is a negotiable proposition. If they feel disgruntled in any of the points, we are prepared to sit down, of course, and uh, see the nitty-gritty, uh, but, uh, but the fact remains that it is the clamor it is the demand of our people as a matter of fact uh, uh, this uh, this is why i said there is room for you know for still further debate even in, with the, with the, our brothers in the in the opposition the armed opposition and so on uh, but this be because of course uh, uh, if, if there are these other things, uh, you know, they, they feel that this has not been entered into the, in, into the uh, what, what we call into the laws, into the constitution and so on, we have uh, ample chance. And all that we are trying to do, including the agreement itself, will have to be incorporated into our upcoming uh, constitution. And the rebels actually will have even six governors instead of, uh, of two, you see. In, the, in, the, in, the, in those states of uh, Upper Nile now broken into three, uh, unity also broken into three and so on. So it is like you have given birth to a child, you should be celebrating rather than mourning. <laughs> well, President Kira's critics say that by issuing a presidential order on the creation of new states, it bypassed the parliament, which was due to have a say on how the borders were divided or to be divided. Now, the general in charge of the failed coup in Burkina Faso last month has been formally charged along with one other top official accused of supporting the overthrow of Burkina Faso's government. Uh, general Gilbert Djendere and uh, uh, Jibril Basole, a former foreign minister, were charged Tuesday with attacking state security. General Djendere held power for nearly a week uh, but was forced to step down under pressure from the army, demonstrators and the West African bloc ECOWAS. Djendere gave himself up last week following negotiations with officials in the capital Ouagadougou. During the failed coup, Dendere's forces in the elite presidential guard detained the interim president, prime minister, and several cabinet members. The guard was unhappy the interim government had barred supporters of former President Blaise Compaore from running in upcoming elections. Now, Mr. Compaore was ousted in a popular uprising in October of last year as he tried to extend his 27 years in office. Now, the U.S. House of Representatives has passed a legislation on the Adoptive Family Relief Act, uh, paving way for Americans to adopt children from the Democratic Republic of Congo and other countries. Senate Republican Majority Leader Mitch McConnell spoke to Congress on Wednesday about uh, the legislation. More than 400 American families, approximately 20 of them from Kentucky, have successfully adopted children from the Democratic Republic of the Congo or the DRC. However, due to the DRC government's years-long suspension of exit permits, many of these families have been unable to bring their adopted children home to the United States. To make matters worse, uh, families have been financially burdened by the cost of continually re <clears throat> renewing their children's visas while they wait for the day the DRC decides to lift its suspension. 
Now, the legislation was passed unanimously by the U.S. Senate in July. Well, we want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we covered. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. And check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Coming up, an initiative to empower 10,000 startups in Africa. Stay with us. news and notes. This is Living Better. People who jump into icy water say the experience increases their energy level and makes them feel good. Now some are jumping into what's called whole body cryotherapy, entire body submersion in a chamber cooled by liquid nitrogen down to minus 130 degrees Celsius. You feel wonderful. It helps you sleep. You totally relax. Customers like Lena Roth stand in a tall chamber for less than three minutes, wearing a bathing suit, socks and gloves, and staying in motion to protect their extremities from frostbite. Advocates say cryotherapy puts the body into survival mode, sending oxygen and nutrients to the body's core. But doctors say the benefits of the practice are not proven, and caution there's a long list of health risks for people with high blood pressure, skin infections, diabetes, and other factors. I'm Martin Seacrest for VOA's Living Better. We're turning now to Africa's emerging entrepreneurs. The Tony Elimelo Foundation has committed $100 million to a preeminent Pan-African Entrepreneurs HIP program that is set up uh, to empower 10,000 startups across Africa within the next 10 years. In part one of our VOA exclusive interview, Africa 54's Paul Diho sat down with uh, Parminda Veer, Chief Executive Officer of the Tony Elimelo Foundation, in New York, and uh, she shares our foundation's visions uh, with us. What attracted me to the foundation was its focus on African entrepreneurship and, and supporting African entrepreneurship, but more fundamentally that it was espousing a particular economic philosophy of Afri-capitalism, which is that African, and particularly the African private sector, must lead in the development of Africa, i.e. it's Africans who must take responsibility now for the development of Africa. So if they're not looking for aid, they're saying that it's Africans who must invest in the development of Africa. And this is what Tony Olumalu is talking about when he talks about Afri-capitalism. The other thing that really attracted me to the foundation, they were looking at redefining philanthropy. So here is you know, an incredibly successful man. Um, he could simply have retired, enjoyed his wealth. But here he was, how he can exercise um, wealth with social responsibility. How much of an impact do you think uh, that foundation has had on uh, young African entrepreneurs so far? The impact far exceeds um, the size and the scale and the longevity of the foundation. It's you know, in the last four or five years, it's looked at, um, it's had developed programs around leadership. Um, it's developed programs around competitiveness, right? It's because Mr. Lumalu himself is an entrepreneur and his, you know, he really sees African entrepreneurs as the lifeblood for the economic development of Africa. And he really wants to encourage young entrepreneurs to think about job creation and not be job seekers. The ambition for the program is to really find and empower those entrepreneurs across Pan Africa. And that is exactly what we have done. What does it take for a young entrepreneur somewhere in South Africa, <coughs> somewhere in uh, South Africa, Uganda, Kenya, to be part of this program? First, I think it's important that you really want to be an entrepreneur. I think entrepreneurship is not for everyone. This is a program that is going to grow entrepreneurs, create entrepreneurs. It's not a grant seekers program. But what does it take for me? It's, it's that fire in your belly. It's the passion. It's the fundamental belief in your business idea. So similarly with the, with the, with the African entrepreneurs from wherever they are, they, there has to be that fire in the belly, there has to be that passion, there has to be that drive to really 
make this particular idea of yours work? I've had the, the privilege of uh, crisscrossing uh, the continent and I've met some incredibly talented uh, young people. But one of the things uh, they talk about is uh, they lack like seed funding. That capital really gave them a start and take it to the next level. So where does uh, uh, the foundation come in? So I want to really challenge that notion that there is lack of funding across the African continent. There is not a lack of capital across the African continent. It's that the capital does not find investable opportunity. So I say to the entrepreneurs, money is not the issue. It's your ability to manage and leverage that money and multiply that money. So I'd say to all of those entrepreneurs out there who say capital, lack of access to capital is a, is a problem, I would say no. I'd say from now having done the program for the first year, T20 um, 2015, financial literacy is a big, big problem. There are a lot of entrepreneurs go out looking for money when in fact what they should be working on is defining their idea. Well, Africa 54 spoke there, talking to Pramida Via, the CEO of the Tony L. Melo Foundation. In part two, Ms. Pramida Via talks about a mentorship program that gave a thousand entrepreneurs with ideas up to $5,000 each. Stay tuned. Now, progress in good governance in Africa is stalling. That is, according to the latest figures compiled by a non-governmental organization, the Moore Ibrahim Foundation. The group says, along with concerns over political freedom, many countries have been hit by falling prices for raw materials. Now, more from Henry Ridgewell in London. To assess African governance, the Ibrahim Index claims to have the most comprehensive collection of data about the continent. Founder Mo Ibrahim said the overall trend from these figures in the past four years raises concerns. We notice that this upward direction somehow plateaued. It hasn't gone back. It's still going up at a very slow pace. So the first thing we say here is African governance improvement is stalling? 21 countries have seen their overall governance scores fall since 2011, but the trend masks significant progress. Health and education have improved across the continent. Ivory Coast, which is due to hold elections later this month, showed the biggest overall improvement. Cote d'Ivoire have done well in every aspect of governance, uh, but again, you have to remember Cote d'Ivoire is coming out of conflict. But then you have some countries which is not coming out of conflicts. You have like Rwanda, Morocco, Togo, Kenya. Uh, these countries really have governments which are really focusing in development and delivering. Ongoing conflicts in Somalia, South Sudan and the Central African Republic meant they were at the bottom of the list. Even in more peaceful states, political freedom is under threat. What we see is a tightening on the space for civil society, freedom of association. The measures of economic governance show some of the biggest declines. Analysts say several African states have suffered from falling commodity prices in recent years. Conversely, successful countries have diversified economies. The commonalities, they're not dependent on commodities. Mm. So there have been something else happening which has been A, increased investments, mm -hmm. number two, increased domestic consumption, and number three, underrated growth in regional trade. Zimbabwe was among the top 10 nations to improve despite continuing concerns over human rights and democracy. For a country like uh, Zimbabwe, which was for a very long time uh, very close to the bottom of the index, uh, those improvements will bring Zimbabwe up. It doesn't mean that there are not significant concerns across other areas. You have to be very, 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 very careful. The Ibrahim Foundation says the aim of the index is to remove the mystery around governance and empower the ordinary African citizen to hold those in power to account. Henry Richwell for VOA News, London. Well, let's stand now for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54, latest design trends during Colombia's first ever fashion week. We'll be right back.
If you've just joined us, I'm Mariama Diallo, and here is a quick recap of today's headlines. In Burkina Faso, the coup leader charged with murder and attacking state security to be tried in military court. In Libya, Coast Guard detains 143 migrants attempting to make their way to Europe. In Nigeria, after four months in office, President Buhari announces cabinet nomination and receives mixed reactions. In Cameroon, officials honor members of a self-appointed vigilance committee who were killed in a recent Boko Haram attack, one of many strikes to hit the region in recent months. Finally, in South Sudan, two-year war leaves hundreds of women widowed and struggling to care for their children. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Welcome back to Africa 54. Here's what's trending. Bitcoin is losing its appeal in Australia due to concerns over the digital currency's potential links to crime. Many businesses have stopped using it in a trend that is accelerated following a move by the country's banks to simultaneously close the accounts of 13 of the country's 17 Bitcoin exchanges last month. Although most mainstream banks in Europe and the U.S. already refuse to keep Bitcoin affiliated accounts, developments in Australia represent the first coordinated shutdown by a country's banking system. Well, next up, a new type of cookie is all the rage in Bolivia due to one of its unusual ingredients, worms. While one uh, may not associate wriggly Californian earthworms with coconut, vanilla or lemon flavored cookies, the snack trend has started to catch on. The biscuits are high in protein and other nutrients such as calcium and omega-3. The taste uh, tests are usually favorable with people surprised that the cookies actually even contain worms. Due to the warm cookies success, plans are in place to increase the warm production level in Bolivia for 2016. Well, and finally, designers exhibit their latest trends during Colombia's first ever fashion week. Designers brought uh, the traditional styles, fabrics, and colors of the country's indigenous communities to the modern world. Sophisticated evening wear showcased romantic silhouettes in muted colors and prints. Long, flowing dresses featured slit skirts, plunging necklines, and translucent lace. Another collection showed off fun, a flirty beach wear in a range of pastels with a large variety of accessories accessories which helped uh, pull the casual looks together one constant lots and lots of bare skin and that is what is trending today and that is our show for today thanks for watching have a good night Music is something that brings people together. Music educates, it motivates, it's a bridge. Music. Alley. On. VOA. I am Sheikha Sali, host and senior editor of VOA's international calling talk show, Straight Talk Africa. The issues that we discuss are pertinent to most people on the African continent.